Okay, well, it's just about seven o'clock here in London, um, and a very, very warm welcome to tonight's talk, which is hosted by the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Shirley Gilbert. I'm Professor of Modern Jewish History at University College London, and I'm also the Academic Director of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Center, which, uh, as the name suggests, was established in memory of the late British historian. Many of you, of course, will be familiar with the work of Sir Martin, um, who, in addition to being the official biographer of Sir Winston Churchill, published more than 80 books on a very wide range of topics, including modern Jewish history, the First and Second World Wars, uh, and, of course, um, the Holocaust, which is broadly the subject of our talk tonight. Uh, here at the Centre, our aim is to bring the finest historical research to a broad, non-academic public, really in keeping with uh, Sir Martin's legacy and his um, amazing ability to make history accessible and exciting to the widest um, possible public. We offer a wide range of programs across the year on all the subjects that Sir Martin spent his life exploring, so please do take a look at our offerings. Um, and I'll just make a quick plug, uh, which is to say that as a charity, we rely on donations so that we can keep all of our events free at the point of access and reach that wide audience, so any contributions that you'd like to make are very gratefully received. It's very easy to donate on our website. So tonight I am really happy to be able to welcome Elizabeth Anthony, uh, who is the Director of Visiting Scholar Programs at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. Betsy received her PhD in history at Clark University in 2016, and she's received numerous fellowship awards, including a Fulbright research grant to Austria um, and a Mandel Center research fellowship. Tonight, she's going to be talking to us about her book titled The Compromise of Return, Viennese Jews After the Holocaust, which was published by Wayne State University Press last year. Um, I'll put a link in the chat when I've, I've finished introducing her. And the book was also a commended finalist for the very prestigious Wiener Holocaust Library's Ernst Frankel Book Prize, um, which is really a great honor indeed and a testament to both the quality of the work and the quality of the writing. Um, it's beautifully written. The book is a groundbreaking piece of research into Viennese Jews who decided to return to their hometown after the Holocaust. Um, the book explores what inspired them to come back and how they experienced post-war life in Vienna. Uh, it was, a, as, as you might expect, a quite a fraught and complicated return, not least because most Austrians embraced the Nazi takeover in 1938. Uh, though in the post-war years, Austria constructed an identity for itself as the first victim of the Nazis, which also allowed um, Austrians to avoid addressing questions of complicity. Um, the book, as I say, is really beautifully written, and it uses oral histories, letters, and memoirs throughout uh, to bring to life the voices of those who returned, and doubtless we'll hear some of those voices uh, in the course of this evening. So today's event will take the form of a conversation between Betsy and I, uh, and so we will speak for about 35 minutes, um, and after that we will open up to your questions, which you're welcome to pose either in the chat or uh, just put your hand up and we're happy to uh, unmute you for you to ask your questions. Um, so without any further ado, um, Betsy, welcome. Uh, and would you like to get us started, maybe just by telling us a little bit about how you came to this project and some of the findings of your research? Sure, thank you, Shirley and, and Bethany for organizing this event and, and for inviting me to speak. and. Maybe actually before I answer your question, I just want to say that this is especially meaningful for me. I was mentioning to Shirley before we got started that I owe a, a debt of gratitude to Sir Martin Gilbert. Um, about 25 years ago, when I was, I knew I wanted to go into this field and into this direction, but before I had even begun to consider a PhD, I wrote a letter to him um, just saying, your work moves me and I don't know what to do with my life, but um, you, you're very important to me. And he wrote me back and I wrote him again and then he wrote me again. And so I have a couple of, of handwritten letters from him that, that I treasure and really helped to encourage me along this path. So it's, it's really nice to be here for many reasons, but including that. So, um, so Shirley asked about how, how I got started on this topic and um and then 
So let me tell you that story. It's kind of personal, um, but I think interesting. And, and then I can get into more of the main points of the findings. So, um, so I currently work for the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies. I've been at the museum for about nine and a half years in this incarnation. I also worked here from 98 to 2004 in the Office of Survivor Affairs. So I worked directly with survivors and their families uh, during that time on behalf of the museum. In 2004, I moved to Vienna and became involved a bit you know, with the Jewish community, but in particular, I volunteered at the Jewish nursing home in Vienna where a friend is a psychologist. She and I had had the idea that I would go there to practice my German and help out um, with activities and crafts and things like that. Um, this was absolutely naive on our parts because of course, Elderly Viennese Jews who live in Vienna now, for the most part, spent their war years in the UK, in the United States, in then Palestine. And um, the, from the moment I first set foot in the Maimonides Zentrum, the Jewish nursing home, no one let me speak a word of German. They wanted to speak English. Um, they wanted to practice their English. And in fact, it, my German practice turned into an English tish that I ended up posting every every Tuesday for a number of years. Um, some of them, of course, also reminded me that they spoke British English and therefore better English than I. Um, but even so, they you know they wanted an opportunity to speak English even with an American, and um, and so you know all my good intentions were, were for nothing. But I got to know this really incredible group of people and more about why they were back in Vienna, what made them do that many decades before and, and also, um, and what they did once they had returned. So it, it led, you know, it led to my focus and also a realization that of course, although I had worked with Holocaust survivors for years in the United States by by virtue of where they, where they were and where I was working with them, of course, they had emigrated. I worked only with survivors who'd gone to the United States. And although maybe intellectually, I knew that some Jews went back to their European hometowns, um, I don't know that I had realized it, at least on an emotional level, until I was there and, and meeting with elderly um, Viennese Jewish returnees. So my questions emerged from that. You know, why did they come back and, and what motivated them? Um, what did they expect? And then what did they encounter? And why did they stay? Um, and you know, the, the, the research question itself clicked really um, when I was then back in the US talking with Holocaust survivors here in Washington. And when I mentioned the Maimonides Centrum and my English Tisch and they were just as shocked as me. Of course, they had to have known on intellectually that some German and Austrian Jews went back to Germany and Austria, but they were sort of confronted with it emotionally. And it was their lack of familiarity and um, with, with this small but, but active Jewish community um, that also led me to realize, okay, there's a question there. If, if they didn't, they didn't know it either at least for people outside of Austria, there's a question. Um, and so I'm gonna share now. There, um, can you see that? That's the, um, the building in Vienna, the Maimonides Centrum. That is the, the Jewish nursing home where I had my, my, um, my English tish. This is the inner courtyard of that building. And these are some of the people that I worked with, um, some of the other volunteers and also some of the, the survivors I worked with. Uh, there's a monthly meeting of survivors in Vienna, Centropa, a really wonderful organization for education and um, remembrance hosts a monthly meeting of survivors in Vienna. And so there are survivors in Vienna. Of course, this is what I, what I discovered. Um, and so this led me into the research 
course, I started my doctoral studies and, and began the research formally. And basically, to put it very simply, what I found with the basic question of why, go back, um, was this oversimplified answer that they wanted to go home. But, but simply put, those who returned had still maintained a concept of Vienna as home and they wanted to reclaim it. So, so first of all, this, this maybe sounds a little um, uncomfortable or, or crazy to us, with, um, particularly with the historical um, hindsight that we have, but Viennese Jews, even well before, before the Nazis had been accustomed to navigating anti-Semitism. They'd found their way to maneuver before the Nazis and, and many had been integrated into society. Many enjoyed great success and although some converted, although not as many as, as, as commonly understood. Um, but overall, there's a great deal of acculturation among Viennese Jews and they were thoroughly Viennese, which I think is, is important. This influenced a desire for them to return a confidence that they could once again navigate that sort of endemic anti-Semitism. And so I, I begin with this point just to say that I think that this confidence among this group and this very deeply held Viennese identity helps guide them back and gave them this, this confidence that they could that they could do this. The motivations, however, ranged. And, um, you know, there were different reasons that uh, returnees thought that they could go back, some of them overlapping and, and, um, and related. But what I found was that there were kind of waves of returnees. Jews with similar wartime experiences came back for pretty similar reasons and at roughly the same times. So the first, so first of all, when I talk about returnees, I'm talking about, first of all, the 5,600 or so who survived in the city. And they are part of a, the first wave of returnees um, that I recognize came back for specifically familial reasons, that they, they were there, they re-emerged basically into a society from which they'd been thrust but had not physically left. They, they sort of re-emerged with the Soviet conquest of, of Vienna. And so these first returnees were those who survived in actual concealment in hiding in the city, um, employees of the Jewish community, and their family members who'd found protection through that employment, those who were um, married to non-Jews and also the children of such marriages had had some possibility of, of surviving within the city. And they're the ones that very first sort of came out and looked for family in the city and, and saw what there was um, awaiting them immediately. Within a few weeks, camp survivors started to return to Vienna too, by any means possible, some of them on foot, some bicycles, some hitchhiking. They were also just going back to the last place that had been home, the last place that they had had family to see what they could find and to see what, what they might, might, might reclaim or rejoin. And so I refer to these first two groups as this wave of seeking to regain their familial home. Uh, the next two waves, roughly, are made up of those who came back from exile abroad. Of course, many had reasons of family that helped motivate their return, but most identify political and professional reasons for rerouting in Vienna. So those who were coming back to rejoin their political home, we're already coming back in early 1946, maybe even at the very end of 45. These were communists and social democrats who'd been abroad with their parties or who found their parties in exile um, abroad. And, and some of them became active while they be, when they became engaged 
in their exile. Both parties told their members that they had a duty to return to reclaim their Austria, to rebuild an autonomous democratic Austria. Um, their parties told them that Austria and Austrians awaited their return, expected them and would welcome them back. And they believed that and went back. Of course, very quickly, they were disabused of these idealistic notions, but we could talk about that later. Um, nonetheless, many of them stayed. And in fact, they did take part in, in rebuilding Austria. Maybe not the way they thought it would be, but, but they did. And then the second group, um, I'm sorry, the, the second group from abroad, but the third wave of returnees really um, came back mainly in 1947. And these were people who were coming back for professional reasons, maybe late 46 and in 47. These were people who felt tied to Vienna or Austria uh, by training, certification, language, writers. Um, writers wanted to, to work in, and write in German and not just German, but Austrian German or Viennese German. Um, these were often people who couldn't get a good foothold abroad, um, who couldn't work or live at the level they'd become accustomed and that they, they wanted to work and made the decision that they would rather um, risk living next door to former Nazis and dealing with that kind of um, issues and tensions. They'd rather deal with that than to work and live at a, a lower level than they'd um, they, than they'd been accustomed to. Um, so these are the these are the the waves of of returnees and um, yeah maybe you have some some questions or ideas. Thanks, Betsy. So I, you sketch. I mean, it's really fascinating to learn about these distinct waves of groups that are coming back and these these distinct reasons. And you also make very clear in your book that while there are you know these the the return to family the return to a kind of political vision that they might have for Austrian professions that at the same time these are also tangled categories that there's overlap among them it's it's not just binary and it's it's really fascinating to learn also to hear the individual stories um I wondered if you could put that picture for us in a little more context so what did the Jewish community look like in Vienna before what was the kind of home mm -hmm. in their vision that they were coming back yeah. to and maybe a little bit about the numbers. You mentioned 1,500 right. in the city itself, but what were the other numbers? Right, well, good I didn't stop sharing my screen because I do have a few numbers. Um, so let's see. The, the pre-war official membership of the Jewish community of Vienna was at a, about 185,000. The estimates, because not everybody belonged to the Jewish community, estimates about the total um, pre-war Jewish population and, and in, in, in a sense, those, those who were subject to um, Nazi persecution because of Jewish heritage, totals a little over 200,000. So there was a lot of, there, there was a considerable amount of, of Jews and people with Jewish heritage and at the end of the war, as I said, um, more than 5,600, so here exactly, 5,816, uh, were left in Vienna. The thing that's, that's um, special about Vienna, it, the Jewish community operated, as I mentioned before, the Jewish community operated in Vienna in some form throughout the entire war. And I mean, from the Anschluss through um, the entire war. And the Jewish community organized itself to support the Nazi policy of essentially forced emigration and um, were able to, through the extraordinary efforts and tireless work, were able to help about two thirds of the Jewish community to escape, most of them to places of safety. Some of them unfortunately went to places like, like France or the Netherlands and then they had to keep to keep moving or they 
the Nazis finally caught up with them. Um, but they were able to, to of those um, 200,000, maybe about 135,000 were able to get out, leaving 65,000 Austrian Jews, mostly in Vienna. Um, at that point, all of them in Vienna, um, subject to deportation and, and mass murder. And that's, that's about the, the number that were murdered. The slide I have here is a poster that the Jewish community had put together um, at the time. This is a fundraising poster um, from around 1940 that shows where it has, you know, symbols and indications of the different places that members of the Viennese Jewish community were able to, to emigrate. So you can see a map of North America. Um, you can see indications of, of, of Shanghai and China. You can see um, indications of, um, of Palestine. Uh, so they were using this as a, a fundraising tool basically to get out word of what they were doing and, and what they were in need of support from the international Jewish community. Um, and so, these these numbers of returnees that when when the previous slide said that about 5,800 Jews were alive in Vienna at the end of the war, then by the end of 45, 822 camp survivors had returned, 138 from exile abroad. These were mostly political returnees um, joined the 5,800. So. So that's what made up um, the total uh, the total Jewish population at the end of forty five, and I'd say by about forty seven or, or or so, the numbers totaled about nine thousand, um, approaching ten thousand, and um, and more or less, that's the number that corresponds with the formal membership of the Jewish community in Vienna today. Um, there's probably just as many um, who are not members um, that are in, in Vienna today too, but, um, but that shows you how, how the numbers increased and then and sort of steadied off for quite a while. Mm. So on the one hand, the numbers are remarkable, just to see how much that community shrank, a really vibrant community, which also, as you emphasize in the book, is not so much an Austrian Jewish community is a Viennese community. They really see themselves as Viennese. And that community is kind of shrunk down to this tiny number. And at the same time, it's not an insubstantial number of people. Um, so can you then say a little bit about what happens? These groups come back, you know, by 1946, 1947, you have this nucleus of a Jewish community. What did they confront? Um, and, and how did they experience that? How did they cope with what they were finding? Sure. Great question. And of course, that's that's really what I wanted to, to learn uh, uh, too in, the, in diving into this uh, project. Bas basically, the context to which Viennese Jews returned included a housing shortage and a food shortage. And therefore, some knee-jerk reaction to their return was about them as com competing for these things, as competition for housing and, and for food. Those who were in possession of Austrian Jews' property and businesses, homes, um, they feared that Jews would return and demand things back. And um, so there was tension and suspicion about their um, motivations for, for re-entry into this, into this city. Um, and on a day-to-day -day level, Jews would hear, um, you know, you were so lucky, you weren't here. Why did you come back? It must've been so much better wherever you were. And, um, and so, so into this context and into that kind of, of atmosphere, um, I think one of the, the first things, you know, that they, that they saw was this, this denial. Um, you're so lucky you weren't here. One woman told me that um, when she went to her former home and a neighbor answered the door and immediately said, what, what, you're still alive? Um, but then quickly, you know, reverted to the, you're so lucky. So there's some acknowledgement there that, that he knew what um, may have happened to her or could have happened to her. Uh, during the time that she was away, um, but then quickly reverting to the denial, and that 
of course, is is also a part of and an overlapping with another really um, important and influential thing that the returnees confronted, and that was silence. That there was this national silence that um, pervaded, and you know, it's it, if you don't, in a sense, if you, if you don't ask returnees about where they were, um, or 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 talk about where where you were or what you did, um, then you don't have to know and you don't have to think about it and, and to to alleviate any feelings of guilt or 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 personal feelings of responsibility. Plus there was there was a, a foisting of blame entirely on the Germans, you know, all all a part of of, of what um, Shirley mentioned earlier, this first victim myth that Austria had been the first victims of the Nazis, and, and that it was a military invasion and a military occupation of the Germans that um, forced Austria into a war it didn't want, and and all of these things associated with that, because Austria had technically ceased to exist with the Anschluss. Um, then that meant logically the, the Germans did it, that, you, you know, it was, it was, it was a way to, to just blame it entirely on the Germans and, and be entirely victims, um, as they did pretty successfully for a number of decades. Um, there was, the, these returnees noticed that all a part of this, um, was an observable, desire to be un-German, to not, to not appear as German as possible. So um, Viennese dialect became much more prevalent um, among all socioeconomic um, classes in the post-war times. And um, you know, in effort not to sound German, um, Tyrolean hats became stylish, even in Vienna, where no one would normally ever, ever wear them, but it became a sign of Austrian patriotism and that they were not German. Um, so this all comes part and parcel with the denial and the silence all, all together. Um, and then of course they they returned to uh, anti-Semitism. The Germans were gone um, and they, um, the Austrians very often, many of them wanted to say, you know, with the Germans gone, all these problems are gone, but of course not all the Nazis were gone and, and not uh, neither was the Nazi sentiment. One of the survivors uh, told me that it had gone subterranean. Um, he said he knew it was there, uh, but he didn't have to see it. Um, one man I interviewed told me an acquaintance, so this, an example of the kind of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic statements they would hear. So this, this one man told me um, about, you know, walking through the streets with a friend and it was snowing and the friend lamented, you know, the passing of the good old days when they had Jews to clear the streets of snow. Um, another told me, another survivor told me that a colleague of his in post-war Vienna referred to Jews um, who'd come back as having, quote, slipped through the grates in the oven um, and, and joked about recontracting the, the firm to build better ovens. So, Although the denial and the silence was there, stuff like that would would happen too, and and they heard it, they felt it. Um, I think the flip side of that is then how did survivors react or cope with with that? How did I don't know if you want to assert a different question or if I can keep going. Oh, you're muted. I'm sorry. Yes, I should remember to unmute myself. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll kind of add an, another little question in because I, I'm very curious about how survivors coped with this, but it's, you know, the kind of obvious parallel in my mind is the the, the much larger numbers of survivors who are going back to Poland and who are confronting anti-Semitism of a much more vicious and violent kind. Um, and so, you know, in asking how did the survivors respond to all of this, part of it is um, why did they stay? Why did they decide to cope with all of this anti-Semitism? Is it maybe because it was of a different variety than the kind that survivors were finding in Poland? I think so. I mean, I think it goes back to what what I was saying before that there they were accustomed. There was always been anti-Semitism in, in in Vienna, and that they were sort of accustomed to that brand of it because um, they'd been doing it for so long and had had success in even becoming more acculturated and, and enmeshed in, in society and 
having successful careers that were good enough that they wanted to come back for them. Um, there were also some maybe maybe particularly uh, Viennese ways of of responding to that. And so first of all, I'd say that Viennese Jewish returnees um, and 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 through today, I, I've experienced it and 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 seen it employed a level of discretion. I, I would never character, characterize Viennese Jews as hiding their identity. That's not what I mean. Um, but you know, they knew the context to which they'd returned, and um, if they didn't know it before they came back, then they knew very quickly soon after they arrived that employing that level of discretion. Um, would help them in rebuilding lives and serving them well. There was there was this silence uh, that I mentioned before. They had to sort of take part in that. Not sort of, they did. They had to take part in this national silence, all as a part of this this discretion that they employed, and um, and also for their part, if if they didn't talk to their Gentile neighbors about their wartime experiences. And at the same time, the Gentile neighbors weren't talking about theirs or asking about theirs. Um, you know, in that way, one could go about daily life without having to think about it or or confront it. And and when I say by one, one could both both sides were protected by the silence. Um, it served in the guilty conscience, but also um, as Jews reacclimated and reestablished lives, they they didn't have to hear what their Gentile neighbors had done or, or how they might might still believe, um, you know, with with the sort of sensibility of um, what we would you know today refer to as "don't ask, don't tell." One could could have a, a, a pretty good life. One and did one survivor um, that I, I read. Unfortunately, she had been interviewed in the eighties, and so I didn't get to meet her. Um, but um, I, I read her interview, and when when the interviewer asked her, what was the hardest thing about return? And she said, well, it was the Waldheim years. During the, the time of the Waldheim affair um, in the mid eighties, when, when Court Waldheim was running for, for president, he had been the, um, the head of the UN and then he'd come back and he was running for president in Austria, anti-Semitism, when his um, wartime activities had been revealed, anti-Semitism was sort of unleashed and very, very vocal in Austria in support of him. And he ultimately was elected probably because of the anti-Semitism that was unleashed um, in many ways. What this woman was saying was the hardest part about her return was in the mid eighties when that happened because that upset the silence that she had grown accustomed to and insulated herself with in order to, to have a very comfortable and in her mind, comfortable and, and happy, happy life. It was the first time she had to hear what her gentle neighbors um, thought and maybe what had they'd been doing during the war. And um, she lost friends. She had to cut ties with friends. And it was really striking that I'm sure that she um, <laughs> regretted and and was was worried was sad and and it was very difficult the Holocaust in general of course and what happened to other Jews but when someone asked her the most difficult part it was more well I just wish that um, this Waldheim stuff hadn't happened because then I wouldn't have had to talk about any of that and everything would have been fine that was what she really regretted um, I thought that was a pretty powerful example. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you raise an individual example, and it, it it reminds me that one of the things that I was really struck by in the book is the extent to which you bring individual voices out. It's, I mentioned it in the introduction, and it also struck me it's very much in keeping with Sir Martin's legacy. That was something that was very important to him, is to as you're telling this very the story on quite a large canvas that you're also um, bringing out the voices uh, of some of these survivors. So I wondered whether um, maybe as we draw our conversation to a close, you could um, give us another story or two. Um, I've already uh, been receiving some terrific questions in the chat. If others are starting to formulate questions, please do 
put them in the general chat or send them to me or put your hands up um, and we'll ask you. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll pass over you to, to Betsy now um, to, to maybe draw out some more of those individual stories. I would love to. Um, and you can see I'm, I'm prepared there with, um, with my friend Hansi Tausig. Um, Hansi was a political returnee. She fled Vienna to the United Kingdom as a domestic. And while there got involved with Young Austria, which was the youth group of the Austrian center in, in London. And the Austrian center was a cultural organization that was bringing in the many Austrian refugees who were in exile abroad, 90% of them Jewish exiles. Um, and you know, they were offering plays and poetry readings and, and um, a place for people to meet and, and read German newspapers and things like that. It was also a cover for the Austrian Communist Party. And it was a way that they were keeping their members active in exile and the Young Austria, the group that, that Hansi was a part of, was, was the youth arm, how they indoctrinated and got new members into the youth group. And um, Hansi told me about a lot of the different activities they did while they were there in London. Um, and one of the stories that she told me was about a book drive that she and her friends um, undertook. They went to the homes of, of Austrian and, and German Jews, they had addresses of where they were living in London and asked them to donate books that they were going to package up and take back to re-educate um, Austrians after seven years of, of Nazi ideology and education system. So she said that, you know, doors were slammed in their faces. Some people just didn't want any part of rehabilitating Germany and Austria with their, with their own books, um, but they collected enough that that they, they felt successful and, and they sent the books back to Austria. So flash forward um, into 1946, um, Hansi and her young husband returned to Vienna with some other members of the Young Austria group and the, the, her, their communist party member, friends. Um, here is a picture of her with uh, her husband, Otto Tausig, if you are a theater fan, you might know that name. He became a famous Austrian stage actor and he actually started his career um, in London at the Austrian Center's uh, theater. So the first night, um, right around this time, the first night that they, they arrived back in Vienna, they slept at the party offices and in searching around for something, she opened a door and and found all of those books that they'd collected, but in a heap and a garbage heap, as she said, literally and figuratively, all the books had just been piled in a place. They'd become completely waterlogged. They were moldy and, and unusable. And she said that it was extremely, it was very symbolic to her that all of this work and all of these idealistic notions had been relegated to this actual and figurative garbage heap. Um, no one cared about books and libraries when there was no food to eat or their houses had been bombed out. So a lot of a lot of Hansi's story um, was one of, of disillusionment, you know, having thought one thing, very a very idealistic and optimistic thing, and then experiencing the, the negative. But she stayed in Vienna nonetheless. And um, I I had the good fortune of, of getting to know her very well and, and interviewing her over a couple of days. And when I asked her sort of at the end of the, the interview and, and I asked her, okay, quick, like, don't think about this, just quick. Why did you come back? And she just said, because we were naive. You know, we thought they wanted us. We thought they needed us. You know, we were absolutely naive. And so I said, okay, well then why didn't you then go back? to London or the US where she had some family. And she looked at me like I was totally insane that she couldn't believe I'd asked the question. She's like, this is my home. There's no other place I would be. Why did I stay? Because this is my home. So this, her, you know, saying this kind of instinctively 
you know, became sort of like the theme of, of the whole of the whole book um, and, and my own experience with that. I have another um, another survivor I could I could talk about for a few minutes if there's time. Great. Um, this is Lucia Heilman. Uh, Lucia and her mother also around the same time as the first picture. Lucy and her mother were hidden in Vienna by a man, um, an artist uh, named uh, Mr. Dushka. Mr. Dushka was a good friend of, of Lucia's father. And here you can, you can see um, Rudy Hellman with, um, or with Mr. Dushka. Mr. Rudy was in Persia at the time of the Anschluss and tried to get his wife and daughter out, wasn't able to go back himself. So his friend, Mr. Dushka, stepped in and took responsibility for hiding Lucia and her mother. He hid them in his workshop, which you can see here the, the front door of. Um, they, they hid here for a, well over a year. And then after a bomb fell on the workshop, Mr. Jushka had to then move them to another place, to an apartment building um, where they could hide in the coal cellar. Um, but there they had to sit in the dark and be absolutely silent at all times. It was dangerous because the residents of the building would come down there to get to get coal from the coal cellar. And um, you know, Lucia later described that once after you know the war was over and they could they could come out, she had to relearn and become reacquainted with normal living conditions and using a normal speaking voice and, and all of these things that, you know, what does an apartment look like um, where you can actually sit on the couch and, 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 and have a conversation. Her, her, um, her testimony and her, her description of her experiences is a good example of something else that I encountered a lot and I saw in other people's interviews too, um, that Again, a part of the idea of, of discretion or silence um, is that many survivors would say, you know, I didn't feel any anti-Semitism at all. And Lucia said that she had to hide in a metal workshop and then in a coal cellar, but she said she didn't exper experience any anti-Semitism at all. She added, like many did, well, at least none to my face. And this was just this was just something that happened over and over in the interviews I conducted and in the interviews I read, and I just see it as a, a defense mechanism along the lines of the discretion and the, and the silence I, I mentioned earlier, and a way to continue to live in, in post-war Vienna. Because you know, then she goes on to talk about teachers harassing her after the war and refusing to understand why she didn't have the same years of schooling of other kids her age. Um, kids kept their distance and wouldn't shake hands with her because she was Jewish and things like that. So she tells all of these examples of the anti-Semitism, but then doesn't really want to talk, doesn't really want to talk about it. And so I think it's, it's just emblematic of the, the larger phenomena. Um, also, one other thing I would add, here's um, Mr. Dushka with Lucia in 1990, it says 91, but it might be 1990. Um, getting his recognition from, from uh, Yad Vashem, from the state of Israel, um, as righteous among the nations. And one reason that it took so long, actually, to recognize him was not because um, Lucia and her, her, mother, her mother lost touch with him. On the contrary, they were very good friends. They took vacations together. They spent a lot of time together after the war. It was that he declined and didn't want to accept something so public um, because he was afraid of his, his business and how it would go in if he was recognized officially. Um, but in, in 91, um, and when he was a very old man, as, as you can see, he, he finally agreed and he got his, um, his recognition. And then here, and you can see that um, the plaque that's outside of the, the workshop here was put up. Uh, in 2013, and in 2018, um, there was a book published about his story and and hiding Lucia and her mom. Hmm. So, those were the actually the individuals I had hoped to share with you today. So I'll just I'll stop.
with that. Thank you. It's always so interesting to drill into the individual stories because there are so many layers and it's so nuanced and so complex that when you, you know, just give the broad brush strokes, you don't get quite as much of the nuance and the really complex psycho psychological mechanisms at work here, as you're saying, you know, on the one hand, there's all of this anti-Semitism and at the same time, this way of navigating it, of coping with it, of denying that it exists in some ways. Um, so, so the the story you were telling about Mr. Dushka just now uh, dovetails nicely with one of the questions that came through. And we've got some excellent questions coming through. And I can see, Paul, that you have your hand up too. So let me ask one of the questions that came in quite early on the chat, and then I'll turn to Paul. Um, and the question was asking about change over time. So you've sketched this um, this picture of the kind of anti-Semitism that, that people were facing when they came back to Austria. Um, how have those dynamics changed over the decades? And have there been more efforts at coming to terms with the past and dealing with anti-Semitism perhaps more recently? Yes, um, for sure. And of course that the, the other, you know, the Waldheim affair forced some of these things out into the open, forced some really ugly and horrible things out into the open at that time. But in the subsequent years in the 90s, um, starting in the 90s, there have been some really incredible efforts on, you know, university of scholars, of, of journalists, and also some really, really important, I think, and, and um, meaningful grassroots efforts in, in communities to, to recognize the past and to take responsibility and, and to show where, you know, like, like putting the plaque outside of Mr. Dushka's uh, workshop to, to, make, to make known and to recognize what had happened there. Um, and the, and the, the government, it took, it took quite a while, but, but the government of Austria, the state of Austria came up with a nat national fund for some um, reparation and restitution to survivors. And, um, and which continues to some extent today. I, I mean, it's kind of winding down, unfortunately. We're, losing so many survivors all of the time, but um, there have been efforts and it's definitely improved. Maybe not as much as it could have, but um, I do think that particularly the, the grassroots efforts and the, the, the community projects that are going on are, are, are pretty impressive um, among school groups and, and small community groups. Thank you. Uh, Paul, please go ahead. You'll be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, um, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. I, I found it fascinating. There are just, just two, two things I just wanted to mention, and that was you were talking about waves of people coming back to Vienna, and I wondered whether there was a, a, a fourth wave, which, would have, which one might have expected after the state treaty and after the Russians left Vienna, so I'm talking about 1955-56, and to what extent there were a number of people came back at that time. And the second thing I just wanted to mention was that you mentioned Waldheim, and I was just wondering about Kreisky, because Bruno Kreisky was a foreign minister and then chancellor for 13, 13 years. I think he was really a senior person in the government for, for 20 plus years, and was, of course, Jewish and came back from Scandinavia after the war. And I wondered what impact that may have had um, on the Jewish community uh, and also on anti-Semitism. Yes. Um, so originally when I started this project, I was going to write about every Austrian Jew who ever returned to any part of Austria ever. Um, and quickly in the course of my research realized that, okay, first of all, when talking about Austria, I can focus on Vienna and pretty much encompass the return that happened because almost all of it, most of it happened in Vienna. And second, I ended up taking my time frame and narrowing it so much because basically most people who were coming back and particularly with waves like I like I've been discussing had done so by about 1948 or so. So there was not I I had originally thought okay I'm going to do up until 2020 and then I thought well, no, maybe I'll just do to 55. That seemed like a natural um, break 
point, but there really didn't seem to be other waves. I will say though, I have met um, in the last 10 or 15 years, I have met Viennese Jews who lived abroad for decades and decided to come back for their final years in Vienna, um, accepted a pension, some of them living in the Maimonides Centrum and um, the Maimonides Centrum actively reaches out to, this is the Jewish nursing home, to, um, to Viennese Jews around the world, just in case they want to do that, because there are some people that want to do that. Um, it was too far after the, the, the project and also um, you know, much more sporadic than a, than a wave, uh, but, it, but it was very interesting to, to have met a few people that, that did that, came back in the, I met a woman that came back in 2012 and, um, and the 70s and, you know, much later than what I had said. And then um, to the second part of your question about Kreisky, I mean, this is just the topic of another talk and one that I would love to, to, to have with you. Um, but, but essentially, yes, at the same time, um, all of this is going on and even before that with with anti-Semitism in the 80s and, and Waldheim, Austria also has had a, a Jewish chancellor. He didn't always identify as Jewish. He would he would have said in many cases in many places that he had been persecuted as a social democrat, which which was true. He he often didn't recognize that had he stayed in Austria, he of course would have been persecuted as a Jew. Um, but he was very important for for Austria in in many many ways. But also, you know, when you look and think, I think he won. He he's he wins polls of the most important and beloved Austrian of all time after Franz Josef. And um, people people still talk about about these good old days of Kreisky. And this is just this kind of bizarre contradiction that during that same decade. And surrounding that, there was um, this very public, very international affair of anti-Semitism unleashed because of all time. Um, Kreisky is a fascinating figure. Thank you. Um, so I have a few more questions from the chat and I can see there are two more hands up. So here's what I'm going to do, Betsy. I'm going to throw two questions at you from the chat, which I'll kind yeah. of connect. Um, and then I'll ask Peter to ask his question um, and Aaron to ask his, and probably we will have to draw a line under that. Um, there's there's a lot of interest, um, but we've also promised to finish this talk. Probably we'll go slightly over time, but let's see where we go. So uh, there were a couple of questions in the chat that were asking to kind of differentiate between the Jews who returned to Vienna, which, as you mentioned in your, your previous answer, was the vast majority of those that you studied. Um, and firstly, one person asks, is there any evidence of Jews outside Vienna returning? And is there a difference in the attitude of Viennese Jews who strongly identified with Vienna and Jews outside Vienna who had frequently complex national identities and citizenships in the interwar period? Uh, so that was the one question and the other that's connected to that. Um, and really a much bigger question is asking about research on Jews who returned to Germany, um, of which, of course, there is a lot. And she's asking, is there a difference in findings? Um, so, of course, that's also both of those are the subject for a whole nother talk. But perhaps you can address those very briefly before we turn to um, Peter and Aaron. Sure. Um, so, yes, there were there were Jews who returned to to other parts of Austria. The um, Salzburg Jewish community, I, I think even today has about 400 members um, and their, their uh, president up until very recently was uh, an Auschwitz survivor who was from Salzburg, survived Auschwitz as an adult um, and came back uh, and very shortly after the war became the president of the Jewish community, organized it. He lived to be 106, I think. Uh, he just passed away, uh, Marco Feingold. And there's a new documentary about him, a really uh, wonderful depiction of his life and his good work. Um, there, are, there are small groups of Jews. There's a small Jewish community in Graz that, that looks over um, a lot of different smaller places that don't have enough Jews to form a Jewish community. And when I've spoken with um, 
representatives at the Graz Jewish community, um, they there have been references made to the bulk of their work overseeing cemeteries and, and things like that. Um, and so there are small groups in other places and, and groups of groups of returnees that went back to other places. But um, I think, you know, also some of the, the personal experiences I've had, the, you know, Vienna is kind of like, um, like New York in the US, you know, New Yorkers love it, but you get outside of New York and other people, not me, but other people hate it. And um, th this Vienna can be, can be similar. It's the big city. And once you get out into the provinces, people want nothing to do with it and do not identify with it. And, um, and I think that that translates to, to the Jewish communities. Um, I mistakenly referred to one of our survivor volunteers here as um, coming from uh, Vienna and she grabbed my arm and said, I am from Innsbruck. <laughs> she would not allow me to continue <laughs> what I was saying. Um, so so there, there is a different identification and a different way of being. That's another question about identity that I'd love to talk about, um, but we just have a few more minutes, so. Thank you. Um, so what I'll do is ask um, Peter to ask your question and straight after that, Erin, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question and then we'll give Betsy a few minutes to answer those. Thanks very much for this opportunity. And um, I think that the idea of place is extremely important. Um, there's something magical about Vienna that always has been. And um, my grandfather, who um, spent the war in hiding in Paris and then wound up in the Car de Goulas with my grandmother, um, by 1946-47, they were back in Vienna and he was restarting his business from scratch. And he could have restarted his business from scratch anywhere. He could have stayed in London with uh, his daughter, my mother, but he didn't. And um, I, I remember going to Vienna every year of my life, sometimes more than once. And I've become an Austrian citizen. Yeah. If it weren't for the EU and the vaccine laws, I'd be there now. So, um, I, I just wondered um, whether in your uh, talks with people, you found that this extends to subsequent generations. Fascinating question. Thank you. Aaron, please go ahead and ask yours, and then we'll ask Betsy to answer both of them. Yeah, my, my question uh, relates to um, uh, just combating uh, anti-Semitism in Austria. And um, I'm Jewish, my wife is Austrian. And so from my generation, I know my wife, all of her grandparents uh, were Nazis and still speak well of, you know, that, that time and of Hitler. And I know it's it's very difficult for for my wife's generation to think badly of your grandparents or to think badly of of Jewish people who mostly you don't run into you know because they mostly don't exist anymore in Austria um, and I've always felt that that what the mistake, I mean, like my wife said, they did learn about uh, kind of the, the, they did learn about the crimes of the Holocaust. They spent a, quite a bit of time in, in that in school. But what they didn't do is learn about the great contributions of Jews in Vienna, in Austria, about the positives of the Jewish people. And that is really what I think is missing. And what I'm wondering is, are there any Jewish groups who are doing kind of outreach 
uh, about the, the positives of Jewish culture, the positives of great Jewish people in, uh, in history of the great Jewish thinkers in, in Vienna in the past. Because that's really, I think, the direction that needs to be taken to combat anti-Semitism in, um, in Austria. Thank you. Um, how would you like me to go, Shirley? It's. Um, do you want to do you want to do a quick response, um, and then sure. we'll wrap. We can yeah. just go, if you're okay with that. Sure. I mean, quickly to to the question about education. I mean, what I what I understand and observe myself, um, it, is that it depends so much on the teacher, and there are some teachers uh, that I have met and worked with. Um, my husband does a lot of work with something called um, Mora, March of Remembrance and Hope, um, which is run through the Jewish community. Um, he's done a lot with the um, education and, and training, teacher training there. Of course, that's very much focused on, on Holocaust and still taking responsibility and confronting that part of the past. Um, it's not exactly what you're, you're it's not what you're talking about. Um, but because it is dependent teacher by teacher, um, there, you know, I can see I, when I think from a from an American perspective that having some sort of like instituted curriculum would would help um, or or be of service in that better balanced and broader broader education that that is necessary. So I can just agree with you. Say that there are efforts going on. I think they're still very much focusing on teaching about the Holocaust and as time goes by figuring out where to put emphases um, and, and how to teach that should probably evolve and, and broaden. Um, and then the I'll just close, I guess, um, um, Peter, in, in response to your question, I um, this idea that, that Vienna is a magical place I have met other members of the second and third generation that like you would go back to see their grandparents and their parents and, and to, to spend time there and we're okay with it, but didn't quite have the same fascination and, and love for the place as, as their parents and grandparents. I've met others that boldly would not uh, go back. Um, said they would never set foot in Austria or Germany. Um, but I think that um, when you said magical, it, it reminded me of a conversation I had with um, Freddie Noller, who maybe some of you know, he was a, an Austrian survivor who, Austrian Jewish survivor who went to the UK. And um, I was on a trip with him, we got to have dinners and breakfasts with him and have long conversations. And, and he told me that, you know, what he's, most angry about is he did not get to grow up going to the opera in Vienna and he didn't get to eat the Viennese food that he wanted to eat when he was a kid. And um, it was just really basic things that a kid or a young adult would, would miss about a place. And it was, yes, certainly it was about Nazis and Holocaust, but, but, but he would really pinpoint those, those magical, wonderful, delicious things. Um, and and he was mad about it, but um, it was it was magical and in a different way for him to talk about the city. Some of the survivors, I would say, talk about the city like it's a place, like it's a person, like it's a family member. And in the same way that that involves love and adoration, it also involves, you know, I can complain. I can complain about my brother. You can't complain about my brother. But I can complain about my brother. And I, I found that that's a lot of the attitude. Um, from a lot of people that that loved loved the city like like a family member. It's so interesting, and, and those those last two questions, in a way, you know, the positivity and the negativity all together, just to remind us again about the complexity of the story that you're telling. That it's not a it's not a binary story. Um, there is so much more that we could ask, and there is so much more richness in your book, but we will have to draw it to a close there. Um, and I just want to thank you, Betsy, again so much on behalf of the Sir Martin Gilbert Learning Centre 
for taking the time to come and talk to us and share some of your really fascinating research with all of us. Um, I've, I've put the link to Betsy's book again uh, in the chat. Um, it's clear how much interest there is in your work. So hopefully um, people can go out, buy the book, uh, find out about it a little bit more. Um, our next event will be on Sunday, the 30th of October. Uh, I will be in conversation with Lord Alfred Dubbs, um, who was one of the Czech children rescued from the Nazis in the kinder transport, um, and has also since then become a very well-known voice, at least here in the UK, as a campaigner on the plight of refugees. Um, so that um, should be a really great event. Please do join us for that. You can find out more on our website. Um, otherwise, thank you so much again, Betsy, and hope to see some of you again soon on one of our future events. Take care. Good night. Thank you.